Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on this HFS Unfiltered videocast, where we really want to talk about how automation and AI can make uh, managed services, business services sexy, right? I, I think 2023 is going to be a pivotal year for uh, for businesses and for enterprises, you know, look at the macroeconomic headwinds. Uh, there's inflation, there's supply chain disruption, uh, there's recession. You know, Europe is already in a recession, and I think uh, we think US will be in a recession next year, whether it's small or long, we'll see. Uh, and then there's this talent crunch. I, I don't think this is going anywhere unless we, you know, somehow magically find a hidden continent under the ocean. You know, the talent crunch is going to be here with us. So uh, enterprises need support for, for talent resourcing, technology modernization, process transformation. And I think while we keep talking about this great resignation, I think in reality, there's this great hurry to get things done. And, and that's the power of automation and AI that can change the narrative of business services. And to discuss that, I'm delighted to have uh, Shivani, who's the VP for Automation and AI at Xerox, as well as Bharat, who's the VP for Strategic Initiatives at uh, Vercato. So thanks, Shivani and Bharat, for joining us. Thank thanks you. for uh, having us here as well. All right. So let me let me ask both of you. You know, you've been in this industry for for long now, right? In in this business services, managed services shared services space, uh, what, are the, what are the one or two biggest challenges uh, today that uh, you know, enterprises are facing uh, uh, from a managed services context? Uh, maybe Bharat, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, you know, fundamentally, when I think when, uh, you know, like, like you talked about sort of, and it's, uh, it's a great hurry is actually kind of, that's, that's, a, that's a right term to kind of call about, right? I mean, with all these things that have happened last couple of years and uh, how things kind of uh, came together. But if we go back a little bit historically backward and then see even what and how it kind of evolved from managed services industry perspective, shared services industry perspective. First uh, thing which, which happened was like large part of the uh, initiatives were actually driven based on the cost arbitrage or the uh, you know labor arbitrage. And that was the main thing that was used for. However, when, you know, the, I mean, when going forward and what happened was when a large part of that kind of got converted into kind of using that with the, uh, uh, you know, the focus from the operation, business operations efficiency, and then kind of using that as a kind of a spear tip to kind of drive the, uh, you know, the, the, the strength of the, the services that were provided by these uh, uh, managed services providers, right? Um, but then when the last two years kind of hit upon, there's a lot more hurry that happened in terms of whether you call digital transformation, whether you call technology transformation, whether you call, you know, whatever the way that you look at from an automation, AI, et cetera, everything kind of coming together and what I call is some kind of transformation that people had to be hurrying, hurrying with. That just happened. Um, when that happened, the biggest thing that was actually kind of going on was like to kind of go and focus on uh, what are the kind of very low hanging fruits and then just kind of, you know, focus on the spots that you can actually go and kind of uh, start looking at to kind of get these things tied up together, whether it is kind of simply uh, automating and focusing on, you know, just adjusting to the supply chain disruptions that were actually happening. And that is one of the things that you've seen that. But the interesting thing that I actually kind of uh, talk, uh, uh, talk about quite a bit with a lot of customers, in fact, when two and a half years ago, I wrote a white paper about uh, this thing, how the things would kind of come together. I was, I was actually doing this as a kind of a very pipe dream types, right? So but it was like most, mostly kind of uh, sitting and visioning and uh, kind of dreaming about this. And what I call as a kind of a circles of impact, I mean, three different circles of impact. Think of this as like kind of concentric circles of impact that I was actually kind of uh, thinking about from an imagination standpoint. The managed service providers, I mean, like when initially they started looking at mostly in terms of the first circle of impact, which I call very specific in terms of a specific process or a specific uh, function or an area that was like, that it could be like kind of a hiring process, could be like an ordering process, et cetera, things like that, right? Uh, that was the main focus to kind of uh, get and then be specialized on that because that was the strength that they were bringing in. Then there's, uh, there's a second circle of impact that I was actually looking at was how would that how could that be extended into the enterprise wide, which means that like you're bringing the all the forces of the functions and the processes together that uh, a, a shared services provider or a managed services provider or a business services provider that can kind of 
uh, you know, help these large enterprises to kind of take a, a quantum leap in, in terms of like going into the enterprise wide uh, impact that you can actually go into it. But the third thing that I was actually looking at was it is not just the uh, business, specific business or the function area to the enterprise, but it's also ecosystem impact that you can actually, you have to bring it in. That ecosystem impact that you actually have to bring it in is where there's a large part of the new uh, revenue areas that you can actually go and kind of get into, right? The Take, for example, a claims processing provider who has been working with 150 customers has an immense amount of knowledge in terms of what are the kind of things that will work what are the things that don't work? Now, getting that entire knowledge in package terms and providing that to a, to a large enterprise like an AIG or a Prudential or whatever, I mean, which of the end, end, end customer is, and bringing that uh, a new source of revenue is the kind of a area where I think, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the top of the mind for these uh, yeah. service providers that is actually coming up. And that's something that I've been kind of very much taken to the conversations when de dealing with the customers uh, across the board. Uh, so. so automation and AI for growth, not just for cost. Uh, correct. Absolutely. Get all the top, right? So but not just for cost, not just for efficiencies, but it is actually kind of how can you kind of spear tip the growth and the new sources of revenue, which is actually making the top line impact uh, for the enterprises. That's the most important thing. And then that's where I think that's like, what I call as there is a lot more to be unlocked there. Yeah. So, 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 um, Shivani, let, let's ask you, right. Bharat has been painting these concentric circles, right. In his yeah. head, uh, you know, let's, let's talk in, in real terms, um, you know, and get, get your thoughts on, on his three concentric circles, which are very aligned, Bharat, by the way, to our three horizons, um, yeah. um, you know, uh, at HFS. But, you know, Shivani automation has been there for like a decade now, right? RPA was invented 10 years ago. Yes. Uh, or perhaps even earlier, right? We just started calling it RPA 10 years back. Uh, but, you know, if you look at our research, half or more than half of their ent enterprises are not really satisfied with their automation initiatives, right? And on one hand, we are talking about, you know, driving new sources of growth, right? Which is completely fair. And, you know, that should be the aspiration. On the other hand, we see this level of dissatisfaction. How do you, how do you, how do you marry these two things together, Shivani? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, for getting the real value from automation, uh, you know, a process has to be well understood in depth. So as Bharat was saying initially, it was a cost arbitrage play. And then it was a process play that you are bringing a particular process enterprise wide, you're consolidating that process. You are uh, building an expertise in that process and then you are automating. So, uh, you know, if that approach is taken, uh, then the success of automation is uh, likely to be much higher uh, because uh, then you can anticipate as the organization automating a process, what are the different directions that a process can take? What are the different business scenarios that you need to cater to? And uh, how do you improve that? Uh, uh, in, in Xerox, we call it the, uh, the impact of the digital workforce. So you can put a bot for a process and it can, uh, maybe that bot, bot really processes only 10% of your total transactions. But there is a journey that you have to undertake to go from that 10% to 80%. So, and you also have to realize that there will be some transactions which it will not make any sense to automate because they are those rare scenarios uh, for which you may not get the returns. So uh, really, uh, you know, anticipating that uh, what are the uh, different uh, directions uh, based on different business scenarios uh, that a process can uh, basically uh, diversify into and factoring all of that into your automation plan uh, is what will give the business the satisfaction because for them, if bulk of their transactions are automated, then uh, there is some uh, you know real meaning because that is when they start to see the benefits of uh, getting things done faster, uh, the benefits of uh, uh, you know uh, accuracy, less rework, uh, you know getting information on time to make business decisions. So uh, that uh, I think uh, has to be the vision. And uh, um, uh, also uh, it has to be centrally driven. I have seen many organizations where uh, it is uh, very, very fragmented. 
so uh, you know uh, let's say europe may be using one tool us may be using one tool uh, you know uh, middle east may be doing something else so uh, then it becomes extremely difficult to uh, manage and maintain uh, these uh, different islands and it becomes expensive so your uh, you know uh, the cost play that you were going after uh, you know over time uh, you uh, start to see diminishing returns and uh, also in terms of uh, tomorrow you know when as an organization uh, you you uh, consolidate your processes into let's say one erp or one crm tool uh, then uh, you know you don't uh, you, you are you are not able to easily uh, update your automations uh, to to reflect those changes no that's fantastic so so it's it's process transformation along with not just you know throw technology at it and assume yes. everything is going to be hunky dory right so 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 bharat how is how is workato you know different than than others or is it right uh, because these are common challenges right what are you doing to address some of these things it, it, yeah so thanks thanks for uh, bringing that up and it's an interesting point i actually want to kind of extend to uh, what shivani was talking about in terms of like I mean, how the uh, thing is and even the previous question that you asked about People have actually kind of adopted intelligent automation. It's been there for about like more than ten years, but like like you said. But why is it not kind of given the 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 anticipated or the expected uh, results in terms of what we are actually kind of looking at, right? So let me kind of peel this up again. Uh, you know, pointing back to the other uh, again the same paper that I wrote about. And so what I was looking at uh, uh, two and a half years back is two important things that were actually happening. One is what does an enterprise automation, enterprise wise wide automation look? when 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 in my mind when i look at the enterprise automation and this is what i've been kind of talking to the customers and kind of got into the uh, into the uh, into the uh, uh, concise fashion of what it looks like it's a kind of a spectrum you could actually kind of look at it in terms of simply take the human in uh, you know tasks which are there to kind of start automating it towards the end to end process that uh, she was talking about entire process transformation um and then extend it into in terms of I mean how do you kind of make it completely like a Tesla on autopilot types right I mean that's a that's again a dream in terms of like I mean having the entire enterprise automation uh, the whole decision business decisions being automated just like a, a you know Tesla on autopilot types so I've kind of painted a picture in terms of what it's called as about six stages of the uh, automation right I mean so it's it goes through about like six different uh, phases of the automation from a maturity standpoint if you think about it the first one which I call is the uh, is the the task level automation which is basically where large parts of the like when like i said sort of an rpa was invented about like 10 years back and even prior to that but then it came to existence and it kind of took that that's where the focus was largely into and that's what i called as like the first mile of automation hmm. the next 100 miles of automation is a big journey that you actually kind of have to bring together in terms of to drive that up right um that involves in bringing like for example the systems together that shivani talked about like you know, consolidation of the systems, modernization of the systems, like when kind of which which involves bringing the data together, and this is being done in a separate silo, which is basically like when what you look at from uh, you know all the middleware and integration, etc., that brings the data and the systems together. That is that is being done in a different silo by the IT, where the you know the the, the task level automation is being done at the business level to kind of get to it. So that's one part of it. Then the third level, which you look at it, is thanks to Salesforce. Uh, this is what I call as the crucifixion with sassification, right? So, which is basically like kind of all, in, you know, 30 years back, there were only 11 modules of SAP R2 that people were happy about, right? But now, on an average, if you look at it, in any enterprise you take, when close to about 800 different apps, apps for this and apps for that, right? Then, with the moment you talk about different apps, there's an orchestration between the apps that need to kind of come together, which kind of led to the API based and what or whatnot to kind of get to it. In fact, when large part of the things that was a fight with, with when RPA kind of emerged was uh, API is difficult to deal with, et cetera. But now you see that the market forces have actually converged many players to kind of go with the API thing. And then they're talking about that API automation is part of the automation as well. So which is what it kind of came together. That, that's a level three. Level four is the what uh, Shivani talked about, which is end-to-end -end business process stitching together, kind of completely getting the transformation together, which is what the heavy duty BPM players were doing it. But then now with all this after this and that, you need to have the lightweight workflow systems that need to kind of come together. So that's another part of it. Then the level five, which I call as the uh, automated decision making. Like once you kind of stitch the entire process, the decisions are actually happening, the human interventions need to happen. 
and that gets popped up into their experiences. Like for example, a simplistic uh, order approval system, quote approvals, etc., whatever it is, right? You kind of look at those and kind of interweave those experiences into that, right? From a business decision making standpoint, so that which, which relies on which is AI, ML, you know, or just a simple uh, data data uh, rules based. Or it could be deep learning based. Now with uh, you know uh, uh, GPT three etc. Whatever it is, like when you could actually kind of get to that level of the things. And the level six, that's a level five. And the level six is what I call as a kind of Tesla on autopilot, which is like the business is like a little bit self healing kind of understanding etc. Whatever whatnot, right? So this six levels, which you kind of look at it, but that's what the biggest uh, thing that I see that people just started with that. That is what I call as like the first mile. It is not that it is not taken off; it is taken off. But they're only the, the first mile of the automation. The next 100 miles is where the actual journey looks like to kind of get the entire thing together. Now, the second part of the question that you actually asked about, sorry, uh, you, you had a question. No, 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 please carry on. The second part of the question that you actually talked about was how is Workato different, right? So Workato is uh, kind of, when we, we, when we kind of uh, kind of founded Workato, the, the idea was work automation uh, was the, was the Thing. That's how the work order name came into play. Uh, the idea was to kind of, well, the, the, the vision was that for doing this work automation, you have to have the data, process, and experiences together in unison. You have to stitch those two things together, however, in whatever the way and fashion it is. And that's exactly what work as a platform brings, data, process, and experiences together in one unison. So to kind of shortly say that, and in, the level, in all the six levels that we talked about it, Level two to level five is where Workato plays an extensively well. So which becomes like that, you know, Workato becomes the next, uh, uh, the vehicle for next hundred miles of journey for that automation. And that's exactly how uh, we kind of look at ourselves. Fantastic. No, that was, that was, um, that was very professorial, but that's great. No, the, so, so, so Shivani, how, how far are you from that Tesla autopilot uh, stage and, what role is Workato playing in your uh, next hundred miles of automation? Yes, so that's uh, uh, so. I would say that uh, we uh, when I when you say autopilot, yes, uh, that goal is a little a little far, but we have a path to uh, path to it now. So uh, we we did start with RPA. We did start with uh, automating a lot of our basic uh, transactional activities, which were time consuming, which were high volume, uh, where we just had to swivel data between applications. Uh, so we we took all that uh, you know um, mundane activity away from our people. We have automated a whole lot of reporting activities, a whole lot of data entry activities. Uh, but then uh, there is a lot of uh, exception management, automated decisioning, bringing human into the loop of the automation, which is uh, what we are working through right now. Uh, we are injecting a lot of document AI also into our automations uh, right now. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, the, this whole journey, the, the industry calls it hyper automation, right? So we are moving from plain vanilla RPA to hyper automation very rapidly. And uh, if we have to get to an autopilot stage, it's not going to be one technology versus the other, but it is going to be uh, stitching together all these different technologies. Uh, so for example, for a document-based process, you will have document AI, you will have OCR, you will have RPA, uh, or you, you can have Workato. And uh, the, the, where Workato is coming into the picture for us is uh, to uh, perform that last mile activity of uh, uh, pushing the extracted validated data uh, into uh, the business applications or ERPs. Uh, so uh, we are also using uh, Workato in our commercial uh, offering where we are automating processes for our customers. And we are realizing that a lot of ERP uh, systems that our customers are using for those Workato has uh, ready to use connectors. Uh, and uh, we obviously don't want to be building APIs uh, or uh, building connectors uh, for each and everything and maintaining them. So uh, since Mercato offers a library of pre-built connectors, uh, and it also offers an easy way of building recipes where uh, we can transform the data that we have extracted from a document or received from an external source like a customer portal or uh, an incident ticket. And then uh, we can uh, transform that data to meet the requirements of another business application and uh, automate the transaction using the backend connectors. So uh, it speeds up uh, the automation. That is, uh, that is one thing because you are not uh, uh, you know, working at a transactional uh, level on the UI interface. 
or rather uh, you are you know uh, doing an api call to uh, instantly pull the data uh, into the business application so one is the speed so you are able to do business now at the speed of software uh, and then uh, the uh, other thing is the maintenance so uh, whenever you we do ui based automation we know that there will be changes to the ui of the application that we are working on whether it is oracle whether it is sap uh, everybody does uh, you know these quarterly upgrades to their platforms and those quarterly upgrades do have some impact on our uh, user interface so it may impact you know one out of 100 bots we have running on that particular application but we have to test all the 100 every quarter so uh, you know uh, making our automations more robust uh, and uh, taking away uh, you know the brittle nature of uh, the ui based automations wherever we can uh, is uh, what led us to working with mercato fantastic all right no this was a terrific session but i won't let you go uh, both of you uh, without answering this question so if you know we're getting into 2023 um uh, what would be your one wish if that could come true for next year uh, right and um, i'm i'm we're pretty close to the to the new year shivani what's what's your one wish I, uh, so I wish we could do for uh, you know uh, we, we could train uh, ML models with less training, less manual manual effort. Uh, so that is one uh, one wish. And the other is that uh, uh, we could uh, spend less time on maintenance and more time on uh, you know uh, driving our automation journey forward. So those are I think the two things uh, from an automation perspective where. Uh, like we are, we are always on lookout for technologies which will allow us to use auto ML to you know uh, do uh, trainings. Shivani is in a greater hurry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and Bharat, uh, what's your one wish for twenty twenty three? My one wish, which I think, been, uh, which 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 is which is very very uh, uh, apparent uh, for for me right now. I mean, in fact, when Shivani talked about that, I mean, quite heavily. Which is the the what I kind of term as like a fatigue that is actually kind of kicked in because of the UI based uh, uh, you know path to the automations, right? So I mean, people have used the UI based path to go to go to that automation journey. Uh, that part is something which is very prevalent with the customers. I mean, if there is one wish that I could actually go and do it, and I wish that I could just make it, you know, throw a wand or take like a Harry Potter and then just go and say make it go away, right? But I think that's. Uh, uh, that's not that easy to kind of go and do that. So, which is exactly where, uh, you know, work out of the 2023 mission that uh, at least uh, I've taken up on my side is to go in front of the customers and talk about and say, there are places where you do need to use the UI based automation, which is the green screen automation, right? Go use that. But the key thing which is there is like, you know, when there's modern systems and then when you're actually living in the modern systems, which you can actually go and drive the automation in a very different way. Uh, you've got to go and kind of think about in terms of stitching up the data process and experiences together. And that's exactly even how you kind of drive, want to drive those automations and make your life much, much easier, right? So there is a place for this and there's a place for that, right? So that's a, that, that's a way to kind of think about it, right? Um, yeah. And that is the core aspect, uh, I, I think, as a mission in 2023 that I've, uh, you know, I wish I could kind of take it to the customers and kind of say that this is what you, you should be looking at it. Yeah, yeah. As so, I said, it's not one technology versus the other, but it's bringing them all together and uh, using them appropriately based on the need of the use case. Yeah. No, this was a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Bharat. Thank you, Shivani. I think what I've realized over the last 15, 20 minutes that we've been talking is the power of hand, right? I think as as you mentioned, Shivani, we keep as humans, I think it's our tendency, right, to keep comparing one versus the other. Uh, we don't realize the power of and, right? If this and that can join hands, right? Whether it's people, process, and technology, uh, not people versus technology, right? Man versus or person versus machine. It's not just one type of automation, but multiple types of automation. So I think this conversation has helped me realize that power of and, and hopefully um, some of you who are listening to this will will also realize that it's it's not really, as Shivani mentioned, one versus the other, but one plus one. That's that's going to make our dreams come true in 2023. So thank you, Bharat. Thank you, Shivani, for taking out your time from your extremely busy schedules and uh, wish you happy holidays and a very, very happy new year. Thank, thank you, you so much. Same and, to uh, you. Wish you a very happy new year as well.